Hello, I'm Alex Lightman. Nice to meet you. I'm going to talk about food, water, and energy in the network society. I wanted to start by saying uh, there's a magazine here. It's on the G20. It's for the heads of the 20 largest economies. Italy is one of them. And they, this is a magazine on que uh, the quest for growth and stability. And the very first ad is about how to exploit the tar sands of Canada. Um, the tar sands, if we burn them, will basically double the global warming uh, greenhouse gases from all of this. The tar sands, for every barrel of fuel you get from it, you have to use about 50 barrels of water. And the other uh, advertisements in this publication, here we go, are uh, Petrobras. So basically, the idea of growth and stability today by the non-network society is defined as more fossil fuels. So if we look at a single coal-fired power plant that can supply about 70,000 homes, so basically there may be, uh, you'd need about uh, 10 of them to power Torino. So imagine out that window, that beautiful landscape, 10 of these plants. Now imagine that they're putting out each one, each year, 2 million tons of CO2. 70,000 tons of ash, each of which would be bigger than those buildings, 95 pounds of mercury, which is very poisonous, and 125 pounds of arsenic, which is also poisonous. In the United States, up until just three years ago, this provided more than half of all of our electricity, even though we've been using solar for 6,000 years. There's a whole book called Let It Shine about how we've been using solar for 6,000 years. We've had solar panels for photovoltaics since 1883. And in 1905, Einstein came up with the photoelectric effect paper that he won his only Nobel Prize for. This is also, uh, David and I didn't coordinate our slides. I find it amusing that he had a bunch of dirty-faced children uh, in the coal mine. This is the reality of it. Um, it's very hard. And there are still places where they're mining coal not so different from that. Each age has a defining technology. We create a technology, and that changes everything. So the locomotive was one of the most powerful entities in the industrial age. Anyone know how many times England's economy grew from 1650 to 1750? 100 years, anyone want to guess? Double, triple, anyone, any guesses? Ten times. Who said that? Yes. Okay, thank you for having the courage to say that. The answer is um, just add a zero, 100 times. 100 times in 100 years, and a lot of it was because of that. That's a big difference. And the space age, going, uh, we now have about $100 billion a year commercial space market, mainly for satellites, but not just for satellites. The space station costs about, just from the U.S., about $4 billion a year, and we put things on Mars. And then we have the information age, computers, mainframe, mini computer, PC, now we have it in mobile phones, and then we have these disappearing, this disappearing interface as we have conversational user interfaces. This is the Pony Express. The Pony Express was having people run on horses, giddy up, yeehaw, and going from one side of the country to the other. It was only in place for three years before it was replaced by the telegraph, which was paid for by the U.S. government, and then the telephone. Um, and the patents for this were 30 minutes apart in the patent office. And then we look at this. This is farm. So these are farm jobs as a percentage of total employment, 0% to 45%. So about, two, uh, one, uh, about one out of every two and a half jobs in the United States what, from 1900 was in agriculture. And these jobs went here. And then this is a scale of tractors used in farms. So very few tractors used. And then as we use more and more tractors, we have few and fewer jobs. So this is a room full of people who know the future. What's the next thing that's going to make, what's the next graph that we can look ahead in the future that's going to look just like that, where we're, we are right here with jobs? Anyone want to make a guess? Who said that? Yes, our ambassador to Spain. Yes, exactly. Robots, humanoid robots especially, are going to make that exact thing happen. Only the difference is we have this graph now. 
And we should really look at it very carefully because it's telling us some of the things we can learn from the past. The past doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. It does have a certain sound. Again, so this is the Model T factory uh, in Detroit and uh, uh, that was basically making uh, cars that could be afforded because Henry Ford raised the wage. These are also where lots of robots are going. Now, a lot of uh, who here owns their property? Who here owns their home? Okay, several people. So, uh, was it tough? Is it tough to afford buy buy a home now? Is it? Yeah. So, there's an affordability index in Hong Kong. It's 17, which means that you take the salary and it takes you 17 years of total salary to buy the average building in Hong Kong. Average salary, average dwelling. In London, it's about 16. In Detroit, do anyone know what it is? It's two. It's the lowest in the world. Average uh, cost for a dwelling is 120,000, and you can buy houses for fit for 5,000, and the average income is 60,000. So one part of Detroit has Detroit has collapsed. It's a failed state. It's like if you have Athens as a state, you know, it's a city state that has failed. But out of the ashes, you have all these people who are coming in with 60,000 a year jobs able to buy $120,000 homes. It's very funny. So the sun is setting on fossil fuels and as government as a leader because fossil fuels pr promote centralization and governments thrive on centralization. Basically just like flies are, a, are on garbage. If you don't have centralization, you don't have to have three, four, five, six, seven, eight layers of government. So also, fossil fuels have other costs. In the U.S., we're actually spending more than $10,000 per year. One-third of U.S. healthcare costs are due to fossil fuels. That's uh, $886.5 billion. That's not so terribly different from the size of the Italian economy. So imagine everything in Italy, everything is being spent on healthcare just from fossil fuels in the United States. Does that make sense? Does it seem like something that's sustainable? And as David Orban said, unsustainability is unsustainable. So also extreme climate events, Super Typhoon Haiyan. It went over Leyte Islands in the Philippines and it just stayed there going 300 miles an hour. What's 300 miles an hour in kilometers? What? All right, 500, imagine 500 kilometers an hour over this building for four and a half hours. What do you think would happen? Do you think you could go outside for a smoke? Do you really want a world where things like this can come down out of the atmosphere and just drop on you? It killed 10,000 people. 600,000 were homeless. And the, if, uh, one projection, if you plot damage from weather, and you just follow the graph out, by 2060, if the graph continues, the weather damages would be equal to the world economy at that time. This is bad. This is really serious. And that's the reason we have to be concerned about this. In the US, now I don't know if you care about the US. I care. So I'm going to talk about this. <laughs> 150 million people. You have uh, the water. Who, who can tell me how much of the earth is water? Who can tell me? Yes, we don't live on a flat surface. It would be 70% if we were living in flatland, but we live in a sphere, so it's 0.6%. So if this is a globe of the world, and I go, ah, my moisture of my breath is the depth of the ocean. That's real. So we have, uh, the world is 0.6% uh, water, 97% is salt water, 2% is ice, 1% is fresh water. But the ice 25 years ago was 2.8 trillion tons of ice. We have lost more than one and a half trillion tons of ice in the last 25 years because it's melting. So that is all turning into salt water. If we keep on heating things up, the, water, the ices will all melt and this is what will be flooded in the United States. Over 150 million people, more than half the population is affected. But let's say you don't care about America. How about Asia? Well, more than 500 million people are in the places where the water rise will come into the city. It won't necessarily just rise and then you'll be drowned. It'll have a storm. So 
we couldn't almost imagine until the movie, The Day After Tomorrow, that New York system's subways would be flooded with water during a storm. They were on Hurricane Sandy's. The subways were flooded, and that will happen more and more. The leading cause of water and air pollution is fossil fuel harvesting. So here's another way of looking at it. If you take all the water in the world and you put it in a ball, that's how much water we have. And if you take all the atmosphere we have, that's where it fits. Does this really seem like here and here that we want to burn hundreds of billions of tons of pollution? Does that make sense? So there's a guy named Robert O. Anderson who said something very interesting. And I think this is a good message for the network society. Those who cannot manage their assets to reflect their true value are inviting someone else to do it for them. I believe that the network society and all concerned people are invited to manage these assets this asset and this asset better. So natural gas uses four and a half trillion gallons of water in the US alone. Water for coal, we're using 1,100 gallons per megawatt hour. Nuclear uses 800, 300 gallons per megawatt hour for natural gas, zero gallons for solar. This is the number one reason to use solar because you don't have to use water to get the energy. Now, if we see this, we see ephemeralization. We see things starting off in a process of digitization, right? Now watch this graph. Oops. Oh, oh, it's on a PDF, of course. David. So what this would do, what you would see if you were watching the GIF working is you'd see every single thing on this desktop turned into a company worth somewhere between 100 million and 300 billion dollars. Everything here has been ephemeralized. So the ephemeralization is going to take place in, the, uh, in energy. And the ephemeralization of energy, meaning you turn something from matter into uh, non-matter, into energy. So the ephemeralization of energy includes 120 million of these wooden poles. Most of them are more than 50 years old, just in the US, and 7,200 coal plants in 2,300 stations. All of that is going to disappear. Yes? You have your hand up? Oh. Sorry, when, when you're going like this, it's like, okay, cool. Um, so now, here is why uh, oil is falling apart in many places. We use in the world today 84 million barrels per day. And over 80% of that oil is from nations that must sell their oil to balance their budgets. So it doesn't matter if the price of oil goes down. They are not going to cut back. They have to keep selling it. So. Post-deal uh, Iran, Iran will be dumping another $3 million a day. Now here, they basically the total production of liquids is here. And then the ca um, the, uh, basically the y-axis is the average break-even price. So the average price for Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, all this to produce oil is $27 a barrel. The average offshore shelf oil is $41 a barrel. That's the only amount of oil that makes a profit in a, po in a below $50 a barrel world. That's where Russia is right now. Do you see why Russia is in Syria right now? Russia is there so it can go and drive up oil prices above $50 a barrel. You can it determine so many things happening in the world just by looking at the price. Onshore, rest of world, deep water here, North American shale. This is all falling apart. Shale, uh, Shell just said it's not going to be drilling in the Arctic anymore. That's why. That's the reason why. That's the, this can explain half of all of the wave function. We heard about the quantum wave function collapsing in, in politics. That's it right there. What's so great about the sun? The amount of sun that reaches the Earth's surface in an hour contains enough energy to meet the world's energy needs for a year. To put it another way, the amount of energy received from the sun in a year is four to 6,000 times as much as we need from all sources. That's from the president of MIT. Uh, you would be, if this was a GIF that was working, you would see this going faster than that and this going really, really fast. So the idea is that we're going to be speeding things up. This is from Singularity University, uh, Stephen Kotler and Peter Diamandis. Whenever you take a technology and you make it digital, it then becomes deceptive. It starts to change. You start to not notice it. You start to get the, the Gartner Group hype cycle. And you know, you, people say, oh, 3D printing. 
3D printing has been the technology going to change the world for a very long time until people kind of give up on it and then it really starts changing things and we're there now and it becomes disruptive. All of a sudden people start going out of business, people start having problems, new people are in the market and then dematerializing. You're no longer using film to make it. David and I were walking through Turin, uh, Tur Torino yesterday. We saw something we, we were sh that shocked us. Do you know what it was? We saw a sign of somebody selling Kodak film. David, David, you went in and you asked him, does that guy in Torino sell film still? He's still selling film. I, I haven't actually seen someone selling film in a very long time. I didn't know they existed still. He has telescopes too. Um, then demonetizing. Things are done that for free that used to cost money. And then democratizing, having everybody be able to participate. Now, I've added four more things to this. So you probably haven't heard these, but they're all complementary to these six. One is decarbonization. Everything that's using carbon will have the carbon taken out. And you either take the carbon out or you go out of business. It's that simple. By the way, Italy has fits and starts, but Italy is one, one of the, most, uh, the best nations for implementing solar. You should keep that up. Keep doing that. Decentralization. And I didn't put this here because David likes decentralization. This is really a trend. This is what I'm talking about. David, come and watch. Look, David, I'm talking about decentralization. <laughs> Deflation. Deflation is there. Costs will get lower. And disintermediation, meaning taking the middleman out of the process. So if you add up decarbonization, decentralization, disintermediation, deflation, what do you head for? In America, the average cost of electricity is 14 cents a kilowatt hour. I think it's about double that in Italy. What's your cost per kilowatt hour in Italy? How much? Do you know? 30 cents. Okay. This is where we're heading. And Italy, the, the power companies, if they're charging 30 cents, you should be installing solar all over the place. There are companies that can make money on three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. They're in business right now in America selling power at that rate. If you start with the solar, the panels for Skylab, it was $100 a watt. It's gone down to basically a dollar a watt, and I know how to take solar to 10 cents a watt. I'll tell you, do you want to know? There's a fluid, it's called a perovskite precursor, and it's from Oxford PV. So you can type in Oxford PV, and you can see it. If any of you have ever had a drug test, and you've done a urine sample, and you've been taking lots of vitamins, your pee is very yellow, it looks like that. But you can take this fluid, put it on windows, and it has 5% efficiency. Solar cells right now have 15%, and you have to manufacture them. You, don't, you brew this like beer. You brew it in a vat and one swimming pool, like right here, this room right now. Just look around this room. Get a feeling for this volume. In a volume less than this room, it's enough to provide all the solar installation that will be made this year with panels. And it's made with common ingredients. There's nothing rare involved in this. So I know how to take solar to 10 cents a watt, and I'm not joking about it. So look at all these costs that are down here. Then here's, here's how the world changes. This is a slide that if you understand this, you can make a lot of money, even if you start off with relatively little money. In 20, uh, 20, 2004, solar was $1 billion a year in revenue, okay? In 2014, it was $100 billion in revenue, 100 times. Now, in 2014, it was 1% of the world's electricity, but it grew 41%. If you grow something 36%, it doubles every two years. So let's say it goes at 36%. And I believe it will more than double because of what I just told you. The cheaper it is, the more people install it, the more it beats everything else, right? So 2016, 2%, 2018, 4%, 2020, 8%, 2022, 16%. 2024, it gets to 32%. Boom, solar ends the dirtiest fuel, the end of coal. The end of the coal age is 2024. And I want to tell you something about me. I have published a million and a half words about the future starting in 1985 with the cover story of the Futurist magazine when I talked about a guy who is a computer graphic artist named Ed Catmull. Do you know who he is now? He became the head of Pixar. So a guy that I, P 
picked to, as the center of my article to write about saying what he's doing is interesting became the head of Disney's animation. And I was writing about graphics as the future language of international business. So I published a million and a half words about the future over the last 30 years. I have no mistakes. I am guaranteeing this will happen. I'm guaranteeing it. 2026, boom, solar ends the use of natural gas. I can tell you why natural gas is bad, but I have limited time. 2028, 128%. That means 128% of what we're producing electricity now is, you know, we're producing then just from solar. 2030, 256%, boom. Solar, fueling electric cars that are self-driving cars, because every self-driving car replaces 15 cars that people don't buy. I stopped driving three years ago. My car is apps on my phone. I push a button and I get around everywhere I go. And then coal, natural gas, oil is done. And with those, the 80% of fossil fuels we've used for our, our energy, and it's been since the dawn of the industrial age, the age is over. The pollution is over. The healthcare costs are done. And a big reason for having big government just went away. A big reason for the US military just went away. A big reason to have a thousand military bases just went away. And there's a need for new models, which is why the, uh, the network society is so important. So what could the network society do if we're not constrained by time, money, or political power? These are just a few ideas just to get you started. One is to persuade governments to redeploy the 5.3 trillion per year spent subsidizing fossil fuels. By the way, that's not from hippies. That's not from Alex. That's not from David Orban. That's from the International Monetary Fund. That's how much they say we're subsidizing. And that's not a B, that's a T, a trillion. A million, if you see this, this is $100, $10,000, a million dollars, a hundred million, a billion. This is what a trillion dollars is, right? So the person, that's the person, that little dot there, that's a trillion. Now imagine five of those, and then another third of one, okay? That's how much money we get to use for other things like Italian wines and cheeses. <laughs> or whatever. So, and then we have this thing called Go 100, where you have cities that say, we want to be, have our electricity 100% renewable. In the United States, we have thousands of cities, but we have three that matter. The rest don't matter. Burlington, Vermont, Greenberg, Kansas, and Aspen, Colorado, 100% of their energy from renewables right now. So, question. Do you have any cities in Italy that are 100% fueled by renewables. Yes? No? Until you do, you don't matter as a country. Until you do, you have no model inside your country of the world that is coming just 15 years from now. It's very bad. And where's that member of parliament? Where is he? Where'd he go? Typical. What does this mean? What is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Because if you hear this, you have to do something about it. It's not that hard, and it's actually kind of fun. And in fact, this is something that I want you do to, to take on as a business. Find cities that want to be 100% renewable and sell them the plans and the equipment and services to achieve this target by 2030. Remember, it's being achieved right now. There are cities right now. Now, the person who social media thinks won the debate for the Democratic uh, presidential election comes from Burlington, Vermont. When you achieve this goal, it opens your mind, it opens your heart, it opens your consciousness to seeing new possibilities, and it makes people draw, come to you. They want you, they believe you, they trust you, they respect you for achieving this goal, because this goal really matters. Then also, implement a national emissions trading system or carbon tax that gets larger with successive bonus, success bonuses for reducing gases. So if we look at this, the EU is doing pretty well. The EU has a lot of places with a carbon tax and emission trading system. This is a big advantage for Europe to have these policies, but you don't have uniform policies. Uh, we have it, you know, something in, Cal in North America, they basically, nothing, nothing compares to Europe. This is where you're way ahead, and if you get your act right on solar and you get your things, you're in an extremely good position for the 21st century. Also, using satellites to find, and other technologies to find water. I know how to find water from space with satellites. I know how to find gold. I know how to find oil, silver, from space. This is a very valuable thing to know. And 
I think that also, especially since you're here, um, I put up a post in Facebook showing people who had built four small houses next to each other so that friends could live together, and it got a lot of likes. I think that there that you should meet friends and you should build your house in a gated community with solar and with its water next to each other because that's part of the trust. If you have trust and you can trust your neighbors, you have a much better quality of life. And this is the biggest opportunity. Sell some of the hundred trillion dollars, and we now know how big a trillion dollars is, and equipment needed to make the world 100% powered by clean energy. You need a lot of wind machines, wave, geothermal, hydro, solar PV, all of these kind of things. Lots and lots and lots. 3.9 million wind turbines, uh, 720,000 wave machines. Italy should be all over this. You should be dominating solar. You should be dominating wind. You ha you have, you're so good at export. I just spent the time at the World Expo. If you put half the effort you put into your designated product of origin cheeses into solar and wind and tidal, you have your, who has a bigger coastline than you in Europe? Who? Uh, okay. I guess Greece. Right. All right. Great. There you go. So Greece and Italy should be dominating wave power. Why not? So, now I'm concluding. What would a solar world look like? You would save $5 trillion a year in fossil fuels, which you don't have to pay interest on. You have trillions in reduced healthcare costs. You have 4.5 trillion gallons of water saved. You have energy abundance, low cost, dependable future. So, thank you very, very much for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Alex. So, I'm sure you have questions because that was a very, very interesting speech. There you go. Yes. So thank you, Alex, for a very inspiring talk. So what is the one thing the little joke can do to make what you... No. It's a very good question. I'm happy to tell you. What can each person do? You can go and you can... Uh, we have an organization in America. If you don't have it in Italy, then it needs to be invented here today, okay? Because you ask me, and, I, and if somebody asks me a question, then they need to do it, and they need to be invented in Greece. And it's called Grid Alternatives. And what Grid Alternatives does is it gets the solar companies to donate solar panels, and then it gets volunteers and it trains them how to install the solar. So I put on a hard hat, I put on a harness, and I went on the roof of a house in Panorama City, California, which is a poor neighborhood, and a person who didn't have much money but who qualified, we put the solar panels on for free. So a poor person now is no longer paying any money for electricity. That person now has never again going to have to pay for electricity. Isn't that amazing? And what did I get? I got to learn more about solar. It's pretty interesting. It's a very useful skill. So learn how to do solar and learn it by helping with the poor. Do you have poor people in Italy? Well, help them. You have all these people in the south. Do you think that solar would be good in southern Italy, in Sicily and Palermo and places like that? Wouldn't that be a good way of helping Italy? Keep. If you can re repeat the question because the stream couldn't hear. Well, it's the, we do have a majority of our energy produced by renewables. The problem is that the reason we pay 30 cents is because we got an incentive, a state incentive, a feed-in tariff. So the grid, you know, I think that that's step one before anything else can happen. Either there's an off-the-grid system or you're still fueling the mainstream centralized governmental. Well, my answer is learn to install solar and think for of opportunities to do it and help Everyone do it, not just wealthy people. Okay, another question. Yes. Sorry, it's not a question, but I have two friends that have two solar companies. And until the Italian state uh, had the subsidization for this installation, they survived. But now they had to change the business because they are going bankrupt with only by the, by the solar. So it's quite a curious thing that what happened is uh, the subsidization was, I think, because I'm not from 2012 until last year. Sure so I want to make sure people can ask questions. Companies of course. Companies go out of business every day and have business. Yeah. Okay. But it's a curious thing that you say, learn how to do it, but it's not a, a sustainable business. 
Um, it's a sustainable business for those who manage it properly. It's not a sustainable business. You, do you know that there are places that make pizza that go out of business? There are. Yeah, there are. There are, there are restaurants go out of business. It doesn't matter if a business goes out of business because you redeploy it. But let's say a business installs solar and goes out of business. It's not like making a coal power plant and going out of business and then leaving the coal power plant. It, there's nothing that's lost from doing that. They have the solar there forever. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Alex.